Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on whichever part of the globe you are in. Hearty welcome to today's epic lecture in our Learn from the Legends State of the Art International Webinar Series in Neonatology. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now we will have an interesting discussion on a very common topic that most of us are but per perplex more very often, neonatal sepsis. We all know blood cultures are the gold standard of diagnosis, but when it is negative and baby looks septic and sick, what do we do? To help us navigate through this conundrum, we have none other than the legendary Professor William Bennett's. In fact, personally, I am an admirer of this doyen of neonatology for the last 20 years, ever since the day I was scanning the literature to prepare a talk on the management of patent ductus arteriosus. And I happened to read his work and the guidelines he had prepared for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Today, we, ladies and gentlemen, we have this legend in per person with us. Hearty welcome, Professor William Bennett. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. To moderate today's session, we have two senior consultant neonatologists from India, Dr. Arjit Mahapatra from Odisha, India, and Dr. Ravindra Verma from Trishur, Kerala, India. I would now request the moderators to kindly take over and request one of you to ki kindly inaugurate and in introduce the speaker before we begin our lecture. Thank you. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. We have a true legend with us today to navigate us through a very difficult but yet commonly encountered topic, clinical scenario in neonatal practice, which we have all faced. None other than Professor William E. Benich, who is a professor emeritus at Stanford University of Medicine in United States of America. He's a former chair of the American Board of Pediatrics, sub board of neonatal medicine and former liaison member of AP committee on fetus and liver. Dr. Benis is the Philip Sunshine Endowed Professor in Neonatology Emeritus at Stanford University School of Medicine. He was born and raised in rural Alaska, and he received his undergraduate education from the University of Alaska at Fairbanks before completing medical school, residency, and fellowship training at Stanford, where he joined as a faculty in 1985. He served as the Senior Associate Chief of Neonatology for clinical programs for many years and as the Chief of Division of Neonatal and Developmental Medicine from 2007 to 2017. Dr. Benny served as a member and chair of the American Board of Pediatrics, Subboard of Neonatal Pregnant Medicine. He was a member of the AP Committee on Drugs and served as the AP Committee on Fetus and Newborn contributing to numerous policy statements and practice guidelines. His recent work has centered on evidence assessment, decision analysis, and practice evaluation, including analysis related to early diagnosis and management of prevention of neural infections, and evaluation of evidence for treatments intended to induce closure of persistently patent doctor attaches in preterm infants. The unifying thread within these studies is the rigorous application of quantitative methods to assessment of evidence or practice informed by an intimate familiarity with the practice of neural medicine. That is about Professor William Benitz, the legend with us today for the lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Arjit, uh, for introducing our uh, legendary speaker. Uh, hi everyone. We are, as you all know, we are extremely delighted to have him uh, for this edition of this Learn from the Legends. Uh, babies with suspected sepsis, as you all know, is a problem for neonatologists. Uh, many newer diagnostic modalities are coming up, uh, 
but most of them may not be available in a resource limited setting. Uh, so to talk all about this, we have Dr. Bennett and wishing you all an excellent teaching experience. I invite Dr. Bennett for this talk. Dr. Bennett, please. Sir. Well, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Manoj for inviting me to participate in this series. Uh, to be invited uh, to a Learn from the Legends uh, series as a uh, speaker, uh, placing me in the pantheon of uh, the uh, many uh, prior speakers in this series, so I do consider to be legends is uh, really an incredible honor. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, uh, very uh, pleased uh, to be here, uh, both to be among that group and to share a few thoughts with you uh, uh, about a topic that, uh, as you just heard, we all grapple with uh, uh, every day in our regular practices. Uh, you will notice that uh, the, the title of this uh, talk is not culture negative sepsis, and I will uh, try to address the reason uh, for that uh, in the course of this discussion. Uh, I'm afraid that the state of the science is such that uh, I may provide fewer answers than questions, but if I can provoke a few questions uh, and perhaps an alternative way of uh, thinking about our approach to this problem, uh, it will be helpful to you. So uh, I do have one disclosure, which is that I'm an advisor to Melio Labs, a developer of molecular tools uh, for diagnosis of bacteremia with a particular focus on diagnosis of bacteremia and neonates, uh, for which I have uh, received uh, stock options. Uh, but uh, I do not believe uh, that uh, this uh, advisory capacity to this commercial enterprise uh, in any way uh, conflicts with the topic of uh, discussion today. I have no other financial or uh, other conflicts of interest to disclose, uh, and there won't be any uh, discussion of off-label uh, products in the course of this. So what's the problem? The challenge that we have is that collectively, and this is true worldwide, uh, we as uh, neonatologists and as the pediatricians who follow our lead have an absolutely disproportionate result uh, response to the risk of infection in newborn babies. And if we look uh, across uh, these uh, various uh, different uh, reports from the uh, last decade or so, uh, uh, all from uh, uh, high income uh, countries, I must point out, uh, we see that the proportion of infants who are treated for greater than seven days who actually have culture positive proven sepsis uh, as shown in the dark red, uh, is really quite small, consistently less than 25%, and sometimes as little as 4 or 5%. The ratio of uh, babies who are treated for culture-negative sepsis to the ones that actually have sepsis uh, ranges from 4 to 1 uh, to 15 or 16 to 1. So the vast majority of the babies that we're treating uh, for uh, sepsis uh, actually don't have uh, proof that they have a bacterial infection. The underlying logic behind this is that we all know that blood cultures have a low sensitivity for neonatal sepsis. And because of that, we know that we have to treat a lot of babies with culture negative sepsis. And because we have to treat a lot of babies with culture negative sepsis, we know that blood cultures have a low sensitivity for neonatal sepsis. So at this point, I would like to pose the question to the audience. Uh, is it true that blood cultures have a low sensitivity for neonatal sepsis? Can we bring up the first question? Do we have a response there? 
Yes, sir, here it is. Okay, we can see uh, from the uh, audience response here that uh, by a five to uh, three proportion, uh, the belief is that blood cultures have a low uh, sensitivity uh, for neonatal sepsis. So what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is to challenge that perception uh, because I think that the correct answer to this question is actually no, and I will try to show you some evidence for that. The first body of evidence related to this actually comes from the blood banking literature. Our colleagues in the transfusion service are very concerned about the possibility that platelets may be contaminated with bacteria. Uh, so they routinely culture the pack of, of uh, platelets that they isolate from donated blood, uh, which must be stored at room temperature. Uh, it's not possible to freeze them in the way that it can with uh, red blood cells. Uh, and uh, because they're at room temperature and uh, they may have uh, uh, a uh, duration of uh, usability of uh, 10 days to two weeks, uh, there's plenty of opportunity if there's just a single bacteria uh, in that uh, bag of uh, platelets for it to blossom into a full-blown uh, uh, culture. And if that's infused into a patient, it can be quite catastrophic. So the uh, blood banking services are very concerned that when they sample their platelet units and culture for the presence of bacteria, uh, that they have a high sensitivity. Uh, so here are two studies, uh, one using the BACTEC system and the other the Versatrek, both uh, modern automated uh, blood culture systems. Uh, and uh, when they studied the minimum number of colony forming units per inoculum that were required, uh, to achieve a uh, positive uh, blood culture, a positive culture of the platelet unit, uh, they found that the minimum uh, concentration that was required was on the order of one CFU per ml, the middle line going across the center of this graph. So this suggests that if there's a single organism present in the inoculum put in the blood culture bottle, that the uh, culture will be reported as positive by the diagnostic system. If we look uh, at, at uh, organisms that are more relevant to uh, neonatal sepsis, including the list shown here, uh, there is another study which was done by Dr. Shalanka, who's now the chief of neonatology at the uh, University of Oregon in Portland. Uh, uh, while he was in the military, uh, he was allowed to use 3,840 culture bottles uh, to inoculate them with organisms, uh, group B strep, E. coli, staph epidermidis, and candida albicans uh, at uh, various low concentrations. And then he did the analysis the correct way, uh, where he established something that was called the positivity index. Now, when you're dealing with low uh, quantities of inocula, uh, where the uh, uh, density of uh, bacteria in the inoculum is very low, uh, not all of the ones, uh, the one ML samples that you use will have an organism in it. So the question that Dr. Shalanka asked was, what is the ratio of the number of positive cultures that were observed to the number that would be expected based on a Poisson uh, distribution? And he found that across the board, for these uh, organisms uh, inoculated at low densities, the positivity index was essentially 100%. Uh, so again, if there was a single organism present in the inoculum place in the culture bottle, there was essential certainty uh, that the uh, culture uh, would turn positive. So at this point, let's ask the second question, uh, which is, uh, related to the density of bacteremia uh, in newborn infants. So the density of bacteremia is less than 10 CFU per ml in what proportion of neonates with confirmed bacteremia? In other words, how many, uh, what proportion of the babies who have bacteria in the blood uh, have the bacteria present at that low density? <clears throat> 
get other results. So we have a, a pretty much a uniform distribution, except very few uh, members of the audience believe uh, that this is a, a very rare event with essentially uh, none of the uh, infected infants having uh, uh, the presence of uh, bacteria at less than 10 colony forming units per ml. It turns out that that is the correct answer. Uh, it is very unusual and essentially 0% uh, of infants who are bacteremic uh, have low density bacteremia. And that conclusion is based on this data. So uh, here uh, is data uh, from uh, one of the very few quantitative blood cultures uh, 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 samples uh, where uh, these investigators uh, looked at, at quantitative cultures, which are actually rather difficult to do in uh, 71 babies who did have culture proven bacteremia. Uh, and they found that 80% had bacteremia at greater than 100 CFU per ml, and 90% had uh, bacteremia at greater than 10 CFU per ml. Uh, if only 10% uh, of the population uh, has bacteremia, then only 1% of the population will have bacteremia at less than 10 uh, per ml. So the closest answer to correct here is actually zero. But as you can see, the density of bacteremia in uh, babies with culture-proven uh, bacterial infection uh, is actually quite high, typically uh, greater than 100 and almost always greater than 10 colony-forming units per ml. Well, if we go back to the analysis presented by uh, Shalanka, uh, and look at what the Poisson distribution tells us about the relationship between the density of bacteremia and the probability of a positive culture. Uh, we see the curve shown in the red line, which is defined by the equation showing on the lower right. Uh, the Poisson distribution uh, predicts essential certainty of having at least one organism in a one milliliter inoculum if the density of bacteremia is greater than five colony forming units per ml. And as I've just shown you uh, in uh, neonates, uh, typically it's greater than 10 CFU per ml. Uh, so as the density of bacteremia uh, increases, the probability of achieving a positive culture uh, also uh, increases in this uh, sigmoid fashion, uh, such that 99% uh, probability of uh, achieving a positive culture with a one milliliter inoculum uh, of uh, blood with five colony forming units per milliliter. Uh, so uh, if we take this uh, one step further and we ask the question of what is the probability that paired blood cultures obtained at the same time will be discordant, that is one of them will be positive and the other negative, uh, with low density or ultra low density uh, bacteremia, uh, uh, we see the relationship shown here. The top curve shows the probability of discordance for a single pair of cultures uh, with the probability of discordance uh, reaching uh, a maximum or the probability of no discordance, that is the results are the same, uh, reaching a minimum of 50%, at a density of bacteremia just below one colony forming unit per ml. If we do two pairs of cultures, the probability that neither will be discordant is uh, at that concentration is only 25%. Uh, if we do three, only 12.5%. If we do four, uh, only 6%. And if we do uh, 22 pairs, and I'll show you in a moment why I picked that uh, unusual number, uh, we see the bottom line which shows that the probability of discordance, uh, of, of there being no discordance uh, in a collection of 22 paired cultures from bacteremic babies uh, at densities uh, between uh, about uh, three and 0 0.01 milliliters uh, is right down there on uh, the zero probability line. So uh, at this point, let's pause for the third 
uh, question. So if we do pair simultaneous blood cultures on a series of neonates in whom the prevalence of bacteremia is 10%, uh, which is actually higher than uh, uh, in uh, most of the case series that we see, as I showed on that earlier slide, what's the best estimate for the proportion of them that yield discordant results, one positive and one negative? For this question, we can assume that uh, the series includes, uh, let's say, 20 or more uh, infants. Get other results. Okay, it's a difficult question, and we uh, see a uh, quite a spectrum of results. Uh, the uh, correct answer to this question is actually A. Uh, since uh, babies have a uh, relatively high density of bacteremia, uh, and we're doing multiple uh, pairs of cultures, uh, we're going to be operating on uh, one of the lower lines on the graph that's shown in the background. Uh, and uh, in the range of low density bacteremia, the probability of discordance uh, is uh, very, very low. Uh, so the correct answer for this uh, is uh, actually uh, the uh, percentage that yield discordance results uh, should be uh, zero because of the high density of bacteremia. Okay. We can go on. Uh, so uh, given uh, this information from the Poisson distribution, uh, we can see that low density bacteremia is very likely to yield uh, discordant blood results. The probability of seeing none is very, very low. And the absence of that discordance is actually a strong argument that low density bacteremia is very rare in neonates. So what do we know uh, from empiric data? Well, here's a uh, paper from Dr. Sarkar uh, from uh, now getting close to 20 years ago, but still uh, using uh, modern technologies, where they looked at paired culture results where blood samples were drawn from separate sites uh, uh, at the uh, same time. So these are essentially simultaneous cultures uh, in uh, 269 babies. Uh, each culture bottle received at least one milliliter uh, inoculum. Uh, so these were adequate volumes of blood. Uh, and what they found was that 247 were negative in both bottles and 22 were positive in both bottles. That is the concordance rate was 100% uh, in this series. Uh, and this is very compelling evidence that those low density bacteremias which should give discordant results if they were present uh, in this population must be very, very rare. Uh, and if we look at the probability of uh, something uh, not happening when uh, you observe a series of patients uh, and divide that uh, by the number of uh, positive results here, uh, this indicates that the uh, prevalence of low density, ultra low density bacteremia uh, in babies with neonatal sepsis must be less than 2% of those who have uh, blood cultures. So blood cultures, with the caveat that at least one, one ml uh, of blood is placed in the culture bottle, have a very high sensitivity. And it's actually just a myth that blood cultures often fail to detect neonatal bacteremia. Now, at this point, you will note that I'm being very careful uh, in saying uh, neonatal bacteremia and not neonatal sepsis, because I think there's a very important difference. But if a bacteria is circulating in the blood and you uh, draw a blood culture with at least one uh, milliliter inoculum, uh, the probability of uh, recovering that organism is very, very high, essential certainty. 
So how do we go about getting a false negative blood culture? I'll give you two or three ways so that we can achieve that result. The first approach to that is unfortunately very, very common. And that is that we uh, might use an insufficient amount of blood. Uh, if we are looking uh, at one milliliter samples, uh, we can see that there's a 95% chance, uh, a 99% chance was shown on the uh, earlier slide, and that goes down to 95% chance of uh, recovering the organism if we use only 0.5 milliliter samples. But if we're operating at uh, a, a bacteremia density of only two colony forming units per ml, that drops down to 60%. So we've got nearly a 50% probability uh, in that circumstance, a half ml sample of blood with two colony forming units per ml uh, placed uh, in the bottle uh, that uh, will fail to detect the bacteremia. Uh, so false positives become much more prevalent as we use smaller volumes uh, at the lower margins of bacteremia density that we actually see in babies. So the minimum inoculum that has to be used in the blood culture is one milliliter. We really can't go lower than that. Uh, by the same token, uh, the idea that we can use molecular technologies uh, to detect bacteremia uh, in uh, samples that might be much smaller, say 50 or 100 microliters, uh, is really not consistent uh, with uh, this information from the Poisson distribution. Uh, there's a high probability that at the uh, lower end of the concentrations that have actually been observed in babies, uh, that simply on a stochastic basis, uh, there will be no organism in those tiny uh, samples. So the message from this is that we should skip ancillary diagnostic tests like the CBC, C-reactive protein, procalcitonin, and so forth, so that we don't have to skimp on the inoculum that's put uh, into the blood culture bottle. So when you get a small volume of blood, which is typically the situation, our nurses are pretty good about squeezing uh, blood out of babies or drawing it from their veins. Uh, but uh, if you only have uh, on the order of one milliliter, invest that all in the blood culture uh, and don't waste it uh, by spending it on ancillary diagnostic tests. The second way that we can get a false negative blood culture is to draw the blood too soon. And a common pattern of practice is that uh, at the time of the baby is born or perhaps even before, risk factors for sepsis are identified. So as soon as the doctors can get their hands on the baby, they uh, draw a blood culture as shown on the left here. Uh, and then at uh, some time later, uh, uh, shown in the gray, there is onset of bacteremia. The baby is not yet sick. Uh, sometime after that, the baby develops clinical signs of illness. And that is the point at which it's appropriate uh, to draw the blood culture. Uh, if you draw the blood culture before the baby is ill, uh, the baby may not yet have become bacteremic. The negative blood culture is not informative about the status of that baby uh, by the time uh, he or she has developed clinical signs of illness. Uh, so it is essential after the baby becomes sick uh, to draw the blood culture at that point. And there is actually no reason to do the so-called screening blood culture uh, based just on the uh, presence of risk factors. Now we've been managing babies at Stanford, certainly uh, those 34 uh, weeks or greater, uh, by observing them for the clinical signs of illness, whether they have risk factors identified or not, uh, and reserving uh, blood cultures only for those babies uh, who uh, develop signs consistent with bacterial infection. At that point, we draw the blood culture and initiate antibiotics uh, until the results of the blood culture become available. So don't draw the blood culture too soon. Wait until there's actually a reasonable probability uh, that the blood culture uh, will be positive. I think a reasonable uh, uh, paradigm uh, for deciding whether you think there's a reasonably high probability of bacterial infection uh, is whether you're going to start antibiotics. If you are, then you think that there's a, a reasonable probability that the blood culture will be positive and it can be drawn. If you're not, you're betting that the blood culture will be negative uh, and that's not the time to draw the blood culture.
A third way to get a false negative blood culture is to check the results too soon. Uh, here's some uh, data, uh, uh, recent data, just from the last two or three years, uh, showing the cumulative uh, proportion of positive blood cultures uh, as a function of time after uh, the uh, culture is obtained and placed in the uh, incubator. And you can see that by 36 hours, 94% of the cultures uh, are uh, positive, and by 48 hours, 97%. If you look at the uh, 6% of cultures that turn negative uh, after uh, the 36-hour time point, uh, many of these are uh, with organisms that are probably uh, skin uh, contaminants, uh, uh, staph, uh, epidermidis, staph hominis, and so forth. Uh, so if you do check the uh, blood cultures at only 24 hours, a much lower percentage of these will be positive. Uh, so only 68% of the true positive cultures are positive by 24 hours. Uh, and uh, that uh, overall is a bit too soon. Now, there's good data from uh, Dr. Canty's work in Texas that if you stop the antibiotics after 36 hours of incubation based on negative cultures that is safe, uh, and the babies do not uh, develop breakthrough or recurrent uh, bacterial infection subsequent to that. Uh, that group of workers has also noticed that if you're looking at the organisms that are of greatest concern uh, to those of us in high income countries, uh, group B strep and E. coli, that essentially 100% of those cultures uh, will be positive by 24 hours. And that might be a reasonable time uh, to consider uh, stopping uh, antibiotics. Uh, if you work in areas, as many of you do, uh, where group B strep and E. coli are not the dominant organisms, 36 hours is going to be a much more uh, reasonable uh, duration of uh, incubation, but you probably don't need to go all the way to 48. But you certainly don't want to stop the, the uh, antibiotics based on checking the blood cultures too soon. There are some things that do not result in false negative blood cultures, and there's a lot of belief that these things uh, may do so, so I'll address those briefly right now. The first of these is, well, the blood culture sat around, uh, it was uh, on the counter waiting to be picked up in the nursery, and then it went down to the laboratory and it sat uh, on the counter there, and maybe it had to be put in a courier uh, van and shipped over to a central laboratory, and uh, it took uh, eight or 10 or 12 hours from the time that the sample was obtained uh, to the time that it actually went into the incubator. So uh, here's data that looks at the effect of the time to machine entry shown on the horizontal axis to the time to positivity uh, for sham cultures that were inoculated with E. coli uh, or group B strep at low uh, concentrations, less than one CFU per ml, uh, or at higher concentrations, more than 10. Uh, and we can see that the time to positivity did in fact increase with increasing duration of time from three to eight to 15 hours, uh, from 30 minutes to eight to 15 uh, hours uh, uh, after a collection of the specimen. But this did not move the uh, time to positivity outside the range that we had just discussed of uh, the cultures turning positive within the first 36 hours. So for these two common pathogens, at least, uh, 36 hours from bottle inoculation uh, to uh, result interpretation uh, should be uh, sufficient, uh, at least if the uh, delay in placement into the incubator is no more than about 16 hours. The second uh, thing that people believe uh, gives false negative uh, culture results is interpartum treatment with antibiotics. Of course, we've uh, encouraged our obstetricians to try to prevent neonatal infection by giving interpartum antibiotic treatment uh, to women, certainly those who have chorioamnionitis and are at risk for that reason, uh, but also prophylaxis for group B strep uh, colonization. Uh, often when the uh, baby is ill and the blood culture comes back negative, uh, the comment from the neonatologist is, yeah, but baby got antibiotics uh, in utero, uh, and that's going to suppress the results of my blood culture, but he was still uh, bacteremic. If that were the case, we would expect that treatment with interpartum antibiotic prophylaxis should prolong the uh, duration 
uh, required for the blood culture to turn positive because there would be a reduction in the density uh, of the bacteremia. Uh, fewer colon colony forming units results in a longer time uh, to uh, the uh, culture being detected as positive uh, and reported out by the machine. And we can see in uh, this data that there's no difference uh, on the left in the uh, duration of the time uh, to positive results in uh, these uh, essentially Kaplan-Meier curve uh, between uh, babies who were exposed and those who were not exposed to interpartum antibiotics. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, uh, data from uh, Sarkar showing uh, no difference in the time of positivity uh, between the no IPAP and IPAP groups. So interpartum antibiotic uh, prophylaxis doesn't increase the time of positivity, but it does effectively prevent neonatal bacterial infection. So in this situation, you can still trust the result of your blood culture. So this brings us to the question at hand, what is this construct called culture negative sepsis? I think that this is really a misnomer, uh, an incorrect label for an ill-defined and likely very heterogeneous group of infants who are sick, but who do not have evidence of bacteremia. Often, it is just an illusion that there's actually a bacterial infection, and this serves as an invitation to prolonged antibiotic therapy that really cannot be beneficial. As uh, Karen Popolo has pointed out, if the baby doesn't have an infection, antibiotics can't possibly help him. This is also an example of availability uh, bias. Uh, one of the common diagnostic co cognitive errors that we as physicians are prone to, where uh, the diagnosis of sepsis is convenient for us. Uh, so we say, well, we know that the data is not perfectly consistent with it, but we think the baby's septic anyway. Uh, and because of that, we don't have to look further uh, to figure out what's actually going on with the baby. Uh, and this results in failure to make and appropriately treat the correct diagnosis. So over the next few minutes, I'd like to talk about how designation of this uh, circumstance as a blood culture negative conditions uh, rather than culture negative sepsis is more likely to lead to decisions that are useful uh, in management of these infants. Well, why does it matter? Uh, the first uh, reason and the most important is that these babies have worse outcomes than infants who don't have sepsis. In the left-hand column here, there's data from Switzerland where in uh, these uh, small babies, 24 to 28 weeks gestation, they really didn't see any difference uh, in BPD, retinopathy, prematurity, or neurodevelopmental impairment at late follow-up. Uh, but in the uh, United States experience, in a uh, similar uh, group of uh, very small babies, uh, the adjusted odds ratios for mortality, BPD, retinopathy of prematurity, paraventricular leukomalacia, and death or neurodevelopmental impairment, and marginally for neurodevelopmental impairment itself, uh, were all uh, in the direction of worse outcomes uh, for babies who had culture negative sepsis as compared to babies who did not have uh, the diagnosis of sepsis. Similar data were obtained from uh, China in a more recent cohort uh, where BPD and periventricular leukomalacia were found to be more common uh, in these cohorts. Now, unfortunately, there's no evidence at all that antibiotic treatment averts any of these adverse outcomes. So uh, the question is what's really going on with these babies and what can we do to help them? So, uh, the second reason why uh, this matters is that more antibiotic treatment may not reduce hospital stay or mortality. Uh, this has been addressed by a couple of series. The first of these from Dallas in an interrupted time series analysis. So uh, this is Dr. Canty's work uh, where they compared a baseline period uh, to a period where they introduced a uh, protocol for early discontinuation of antibiotics when the cultures were negative. Uh, in this study at 36 hours of age. And they found that by taking a more systematic approach, they could reduce the, uh, uh, increase the number of uh, babies who received fewer than five days of antibiotics from only 31%, that is two thirds of their babies got more than five days of antibiotics, uh, 
uh, and they were able to increase that uh, to uh, 62%. So only about one third of the babies got longer courses. Now in this study, they found that there was a statistically significant increase in the length of stay from a median of seven to a median of eight days, uh, which uh, their subgroup uh, analysis uh, uh, and postdoc trying to drill into this didn't reveal why uh, this might be the case. There wasn't a clear explanation. The difference here is small, however, uh, and it's statistically significant because of their very large sample size uh, and the fact that they used a non-parametric uh, uh, Wilcoxon uh, test uh, to, to uh, compare uh, these groups. So statistically significantly, uh, but uh, clinically uh, probably not terribly relevant. And that they saw that there was no difference in the mortality, 6.1 versus 6.8% among the subgroup of their infants who were less than 32 weeks gestation. In a second series uh, that is a little bit more current temporarily, 2016 to 2019, of infants less than 35 weeks in Chicago, uh, they looked at retrospective matched cohorts and they compared uh, babies with suspected sepsis who were exposed to antibiotics for less than or equal to or more than three days. And they found that the babies with the longer exposures uh, had longer uh, duration of stay, uh, 48 versus 35 uh, days at the median. Uh, and they also found that the mortality uh, was about double, but because of their relatively small sample size of only 150 babies, that was not statistically significant. So what we don't know from this is whether the longer duration of antibiotics led to the longer length of stay or the fact that the baby was sicker, uh, resulting in both the longer length of stay and the longer duration of antibiotics. Uh, and this may be uh, a, a correlation rather than a causal relationship. So both the sequelae and benefits of antibiotic treatment in this setting remain very poorly defined. And there's a rich opportunity for investigation available for any uh, of our younger colleagues who might want to pursue this. So uh, Dr. Canty, uh, in his uh, really wonderful commentary uh, from uh, just over a year ago, uh, pointed out that these clinical scenarios can be uh, diagnosed as culture negative sepsis. So they could be divided into those who probably had bacterial sepsis and those with non-bacteremic diseases. So under probable bacterial sepsis with a negative culture, there may be insufficient inoculant volume, which we've talked about. Pre-treatment, probably not a real phenomenon. Premature culture, we talked about. Uh, and then there are some organisms which are difficult to culture, or there may be ultra-low density bacteremia. And we talked about the very low probability of existence of ultra-low density bacteremia uh, in our neonatal populations. I don't think I'll say much more about that. And then there are a variety of non-bacteremic diseases that we'll look at in more detail momentarily. So uh, in that uh, same paper, Dr. Canty presented uh, an equation uh, that uh, described the probability of culture-negative sepsis. Uh, and uh, I was really fascinated by that, but I thought that I would reframe that a little bit. I love equations myself. Uh, so if we uh, look at the babies in whom sepsis is suspected, but blood culture uh, results are negative, we can divide them up into babies who have no disease, those that have bacterial infection, and note that I'm saying bacterial infection, not bacteremia here, uh, those who have other infections, non-bacterial, and those who have non-infectious conditions. And then the equation that I would write, uh, which is leveraged off of the uh, Canty's suggestion, is what is the probability that antibiotics will be beneficial in a baby who is ill, but the blood culture is negative? And that's the sum over all of these conditions of uh, the probability that the baby has a particular diagnosis, given their clinical condition, times the probability that the blood culture will be negative if they have that diagnosis, times the probability that antibiotics will be affected uh, if they have that particular diagnosis. And you will notice that the probability that antibiotics will be affected if there is no disease, if there are other non-bacterial infections, or if the process is non-infectious, 
is zero. So the equation at the bottom here simplifies quite nicely. What is the probability uh, that the diagnosis is bacterial infection? What is the probability that the blood culture will be negative, uh, which is low if the baby has bacteremia, but may not be with other conditions as we'll talk about. And what is the probability that antibiotics will be effective? Uh, it's important in this last term to uh, note what is the probability that the antibiotics that we initially choose to use will be effective. Uh, and an example of uh, how this distinction uh, is important might be uh, in the uh, preterm infant whose mother has received a, uh, an extended period of latency antibiotics to suppress the development of chorioamnionitis because she's got ruptured membranes. Uh, and then the baby goes ahead and delivers at 27 or 28 weeks anyway. Uh, if we treat that baby with uh, our standard uh, WHO recommended uh, ampicillin and gentamicin, uh, but the baby is colonized with uh, an extended uh, bacterial resistant uh, E. coli, those antibiotics are not going to be affected. So this term is going to be essentially zero uh, given the organism that the baby is, is infected with. Uh, on the other hand, if that baby uh, was uh, delivered uh, prematurely, uh, primarily for maternal indications, happened to be colonized with group B strep, the ampicillin will be highly effective, uh, and this term will be essentially one. So let's look at each of these categories in a little bit more detail. So uh, first, the bacterial diseases where the cultures will be negative, uh, can be divided up, I think, into these three specific groups. There may be fastidious uh, organisms, including the obligate anaerobes, uh, and there are a few organisms that uh, really uh, do not grow uh, well under anaerobic conditions, but these are relatively unusual. Uh, because uh, obligate anaerobic infections are relatively unusual in babies, uh, my recommendation is to invest all of the blood uh, in the aerobic bottle uh, and the facultative anaerobes uh, will grow there. The few obligate anaerobes uh, will still potentially be missed. Uh, urea plasma and mycoplasma, of course, can't be grown in routine blood, blood uh, culture uh, media, nor can chlamydia. Uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, unfortunately, still uh, quite a rampant infection in our populations. Uh, is a relatively fastidious organism uh, and uh, doesn't uh, uh, isn't routinely uh, recovered uh, with reliability with routine cultures. Uh, and uh, brucellosis is another uh, fastidious organism uh, which may be cultured, but uh, the uh, yield uh, there is going to be lower. Organisms that are simply not culture culturable, treponema pallidum. Uh, I don't know what's going on in the part of the world where all of you work, but here in California, we are having a resurgence of uh, syphilis uh, and uh, are seeing many more cases of congenital syphilis uh, than we had seen uh, historically. There's been a huge increase uh, in this disease in our population in the last five years or so. Unusual organisms, including Snethia, Lepatricia, and Leptospirosis, uh, uh, cannot be cultured uh, and will not be recovered from the blood culture. Finally, and this is a large uh, uh, contributor to this population uh, in my experience, focal bacterial infections may not be associated with bacteremia. We know, for example, that with pneumonia, about 40% uh, of the infants who have a, uh, an infiltrate on chest X-ray uh, respiratory distress uh, and a tracheal aspirate uh, from which bacteria uh, are recovered uh, at the time of initial intubation when the trachea should, should be sterile uh, will not have a positive blood culture. We know the substantial portion of the babies with culture proven bacterial meningitis, somewhere between 15 and 50 percent, do not have a positive blood culture. Urinary tract infections are even less commonly. Uh, associated with bacteremia, but we don't really know in the neonate whether the problem there is that we're overdiagnosing infection in the urinary tract or under uh, uh, diagnosing uh, bacteremia or there's a low prevalence of bacteremia. Certainly the situation of urosepsis where uh, both the urinary tract and the blood are infected is a real phenomenon. 
There's very little data on the prevalence of bacteremia with osteomyelitis or uh, septic arthritis, cellulitis, omphalitis, uh, and uh, finally, uh, Bordetella pertussis uh, uh, is not associated uh, with uh, bacterial infection or uh, bac bacteremia uh, from which uh, you can rec recover the organism. Uh, and in all of these cases, specific diagnostic tests are required and standard antibiotics are likely to be uh, ineffective. Uh, for some of the conditions on the right, the standard antibiotics may be appropriate, uh, but if you're dealing with meningitis or osteomyelitis, you may need to use larger doses and for longer periods of time. Second category is babies who appear sick, but actually really don't have uh, diagnosable disease. Uh, and this includes babies with risk factors only. Uh, in this situation, uh, the baby may have multiple maternal risk factors identified, prolonged rupture of membranes, interpartum fever, GBS colonization, whatever. Uh, but if the baby looks well, uh, they may in fact not be sick. Uh, and in that situation, antibiotics aren't going to be helpful. And as I mentioned, for our 34-week gestation and older uh, infants here at Stanford, uh, we are not treating uh, with empiric antibiotics for risk factors only. Babies who are immature may show signs consistent with sepsis, including very nonspecific uh, things such as poor feeding uh, or apnea events. Uh, these are developmental in nature and do not reflect the sepsis. Unfortunately, it can be very difficult uh, to distinguish the babies in whom this is simply a developmental phenomenon uh, from those who are developing uh, a bacterial infection and who may be bacteremic. But here, of course, we're saying that the blood culture is negative. And if the blood culture is negative, we should be confident that we can stop antibiotics uh, for those indications. There are a number of transitional uh, events that can mimic sepsis, the most common being transient tachypnea. Uh, I've had lengthy discussions with uh, Dr. Polin, uh, my friend and, and colleague from uh, Columbia, uh, uh, about this situation. And I think uh, our uh, consensus to the extent we're able to achieve one uh, is that transient tachypnea is, is a process uh, that starts out essentially immediately after birth, uh, may remain stable uh, for a couple of hours, but then progressively improves. Uh, whereas babies who have uh, pneumonia uh, or respiratory distress as a result of bacterial infection uh, either fail to show improvement uh, by six hours of age or they show signs of worsening respiratory distress earlier on. Uh, and in those situations, diagnostic evaluation and initiation of antibiotics uh, may be appropriate. Babies may also present with hypothermia, hypoglycemia, and jaundice. Uh, these findings have a low positive predictive value for the presence of bacterial infection. Uh, and uh, unless there's a failure of response to more specific therapies, antibiotics are unnecessary in that situation. And finally, there are a number of things that we do to babies that may make them appear ill. Hypermagnesemia is an increasingly uh, frequent observation. Not only are we giving magnesium to mothers for management of their uh, preeclampsia or hypertensive disease of pregnancy, but we're also using it now for neuroprotection in our preterm babies. And the babies who are hypermagnesemic are often uh, uh, hypotonic, they feed poorly, uh, they may have apnea, and they may need support for that reason. Uh, so they can actually look uh, as though they're quite ill. Uh, opiate exposures. Uh, the uh, opiates that are used for mothers, I think, are being used uh, more judiciously uh, these days. Uh, and uh, the, the tendency is to use sugar-acting opiates, which uh, uh, fairly quickly uh, disappear uh, from the baby's uh, circulation, uh, uh, drugs like fentanyl. Uh, so uh, uh, if there has been an opiate exposure, particularly with a longer acting agent uh, uh, like Dilaudid or Demerol, uh, that is something that should be considered and uh, Narcan to reverse that may be helpful. In our intensive care unit, uh, we see babies having apneas with exposure to prostaglandin to keep their ductus open. Uh, if they have congenital heart disease, uh, that is not sepsis uh, uh, when, when they have apneas or fevers in association uh, with that uh, medication. Uh, 
And later on, as we begin immunizing babies, uh, responses with fevers, uh, irritability, and perhaps poor feeding uh, may uh, be a manifestation of this non-disease uh, circumstance. Next are the category of infections, which are non-bacterial in nature, uh, which of course we can divide up into fungal, parasitic, and viral. The fungal diseases most commonly in the NICU, candida. Uh, we are seeing much less Malassezia furfur uh, these days. That's a fungal organism that is associated uh, with the delivery of intravenous uh, lipid solutions. With the more modern intravenous uh, lipid solutions that we've been using for the last 10 or 15 years, uh, that organism seems to be much less common than it was 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, Aspergillus uh, is a soil uh, fungus uh, that uh, can uh, be airborne and can infect babies. Uh, and uh, this is particularly seen uh, in uh, places where uh, immunocompromised newborn infants are exposed uh, to disturbed soil. So agricultural areas, construction sites, things of that sort. Uh, but that uh, can definitely uh, be a, a cause of pneumonias and uh, brain abscesses uh, in those babies. Parasitic disease, I think uh, those of you in the audience know these conditions much better than I. Certainly malaria is more familiar to you than it is to me. Uh, but also toxoplasmosis, of course, Chagas disease and Babesia, uh, uh, the latter two being uh, tropical conditions and again being more uh, familiar uh, to you than to me. Uh, for all of these uh, parasitic and, and fungal conditions, the specific diagnostic studies are uh, have to be targeted to the particular organism. And of course, antibiotics will be ineffective. There are a number of viral diseases, the respiratory viruses, of course, uh, including respiratory syncytial virus, now COVID, uh, adenovirus. Uh, enterovirus is a very, very common uh, organism infecting babies. Uh, I believe that enterovirus uh, infection in mothers uh, who are slightly preterm, 34, 35, 36 weeks gestation, may trigger the premature onset of labor. I don't think it triggers premature onset labor at 26, 27, 28 weeks. Uh, but uh, these babies who are closer to term, uh, delivered to mothers who may not realize that they have an enterovirus infection, uh, may have very significant enteroviral disease acquired uh, from their mother uh, that develops over the first few days after birth. The manifestations may be as simple as just a, an enteroviral exanthem or as complex as disseminated enteroviral disease with uh, pneumonia, liver failure, uh, and meningoencephalitis. Cytomegalovirus, of course, is a very common organism, uh, affects a uh, variety uh, of different organ systems. Uh, and uh, it's important to be aware of that one because there is a specific treatment uh, that can reduce the risk of long-term uh, morbidities uh, in babies who have uh, that organism. Uh, coronavirus, I've mentioned, and finally herpes simplex virus uh, can, uh, of course, also uh, be a manifestation uh, uh, be manifest as uh, what appears to be uh, neonatal sepsis. And for that, there's also a specific treatment. Finally, there are a number of non-infectious conditions that can make a baby appear to be ill, uh, but which are not associated with positive blood culture because bacteremia is not a part of it. The hemodynamic conditions, uh, coarctation of the aorta and uh, shock or focal ischemia uh, can result in uh, poor peripheral perfusion a baby who's lethargic uh, or uh, obviously quite uncomfortable uh, and uh, may be associated with meta or, uh, lactic acidosis, uh, which uh, makes you think of, about possible uh, septic shock. Uh, those uh, conditions require specific uh, treatment. Uh, coarctation can be managed quite nicely with a prostaglandin infusion, uh, but antibiotic therapy is not going to be helpful there. Respiratory diseases, RDS in our preterm population, aspiration pneumonia in our term population uh, will uh, also uh, cause the baby to have needs for respiratory support, but not a need for antibiotics. A number of metabolic diseases can be associated uh, with a septic appearance, certainly all of the lactic acidemias, the fatty acid oxidation or disorders, uh, hyperaminemia, uh, 
of uh, all sorts, but certainly including the uh, urea cycle uh, disorders. Uh, so those primary uh, metabolic uh, disorders uh, of uh, intrinsic metabolism, uh, those babies uh, look and act sick and may look for all the world as though they're septic. Cortisol deficiency is essentially endemic in our tiniest babies. Uh, and of course, uh, babies uh, with congenital adrenal hyperplasia uh, need uh, cortisol uh, replacement. Uh, so uh, this is a more common problem in our small babies than I, I believe uh, most of us are alert to, and it's something uh, to consider. Uh, certainly when you see a baby who has respiratory distress, is hemodynamically unstable, uh, the chest X-ray shows bilateral consolidations. Uh, typically, the heart appears to be small. Uh, 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 these babies may not need antibiotics, but they may need cortisol. Uh, and finally, a condition that I've just learned about recently, and again, I think is probably a lot more familiar to you than it is to me, uh, but beriberi thiamine deficiency, uh, which of course uh, is a dietary deficiency that goes along uh, with subsistence on uh, a diet that is uh, essentially exclusive uh, processed rice uh, or dominantly processed rice, uh, where the mother has inadequate thiamine levels. Uh, and I've just learned uh, from people from uh, your community, those of you who practice in South Asia, uh, that this condition is actually the most common cause of neonatal uh, pulmonary hypertension uh, in uh, your part of the world. Uh, so a little bit of thiamine will go a long ways there. Antibiotics aren't going to be helpful. And finally, there are a number of immune-mediated conditions, neonatal lupus, uh, gestationally associated liver disease, uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. I have to practice saying that. Uh, and uh, finally, the isoimmune neutropenias or thrombocytopenias uh, all, all have uh, laboratory and, in some cases, clinical manifestations uh, consistent with neonatal uh, sepsis. But specific diagnostic studies are required for these, and antibiotics are not effective. So, so that leaves us with a bunch of unanswered questions. What unrecognized conditions are responsible for blood culture negative sepsis-like illnesses in newborn infants? There are essentially no surveys where a comprehensive diagnostic evaluation has been routinely performed uh, in a population of babies who have blood culture uh, negative results, uh, but who appear to be septic. So we don't really know what from that long list of possibilities uh, that I have just given you is most likely and which are least likely and how to stratify the risk uh, and uh, how to sequence our diagnostic evaluation accordingly. What outcomes are associated with these blood culture negative conditions? I showed some preliminary data that suggests that babies with blood culture negative uh, septic-like conditions have worse outcomes, uh, but the answer is really not in. Uh, we don't know overall what the uh, spectrum of outcomes are, and we don't know what the predictive factors are for adverse outcomes. What interventions can modify those adverse outcomes? Does empiric antibiotic therapy do so? Uh, interestingly, we don't know uh, the answer to either of these questions. Antibiotic therapy in the absence of bacteremia is not likely to be helpful, but if you have a focal bacterial infection, uh, such as osteomyelitis uh, or bacterial meningitis, it may be actually quite essential. Is there such a thing as partially treated neonatal sepsis? That is, it's culture negative, but it will recrudesce unless treated for a longer course. This belief is really the driving force uh, behind our common practice of, I know the culture is negative, but I'm gonna continue the antibiotics because I think the baby has bacterial infection. Uh, and we need better data to support uh, that practice. Uh, with the exception of focal bacterial infections not associated with bacteremia, which we should search for assiduously, uh, treatment with antibiotics are not uh, going uh, to uh, improve outcomes and stopping the antibiotics is not going to lead to recrudescence of a bacterial infection. So we need to know how can focal or occult bacterial infections more reliably be recognized or excluded 
Uh, and here's an opportunity for the application of uh, new technologies, perhaps the use of biomarkers uh, or uh, metabolomics, proteomics, things of that sort, uh, for uh, allowing us to identify the babies who do have bacterial infections, but who are not bacteremic. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, how can we gain confidence that it is safe to discontinue antibiotic therapy when blood culture results are negative? I think Dr. Joseph Canty uh, in Texas is taking the lead on this. Uh, they're doing studies uh, based on the SCOUT trial uh, where they're systematically demonstrating that stopping antibiotics when cultures are negative uh, is safe. Now, because we're dealing with low prevalence condition, it's going to take a large sample size, a large number of infants managed with that approach uh, before we can be confident uh, in the safety, but I think that that will be coming. So uh, all of these uh, questions are opportunities for research. Uh, they can all be done without, or most of them can be done without access to uh, esoteric technologies uh, because uh, these are based in our nurseries, which are in fact our clinical laboratories where we can do good science. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. That was an amazing uh, lecture going through all the aspects. Now I would uh, uh, request the moderators to kindly uh, initiate the panel discussion. Rajiv, you are muted. You can start. You, you, you are muted, Dr. Arjit. You are muted. Sorry. So so nicely and elegantly elaborately then it's uh, explained us the things so we're all delighted so there are a few questions from the audience so the first one is what is the effect of prior antibiotic before sending blood culture on the culture units uh, i'm sorry i was having difficulty hearing the question so what is the effect of prior antibiotics on the yield of blood culture Uh, the, the effect of prior antibiotics on the yield of the blood cultures. Yeah, uh, right. yeah th this is an, uh, uh, an issue that Canty has, has addressed. Uh, uh, certainly, we think that antibiotics uh, result in fewer positive blood cultures. Uh, how long that takes, we're not really sure, but it may happen very quickly. Uh, I, I know personally of an experience where... Uh, we gave antibiotics uh, to a baby who was doing very poorly and we wanted the antibiotics on board right away uh, and drew the blood culture less than an hour later. Uh, and the blood culture was sterile, uh, but the endotracheal tube aspirate showed sheets of group B strep organisms. So we know the baby had group B strep pneumonia uh, and uh, less than an hour of, of treatment with ampicillin was enough to sterilize uh, that massive infection. Uh, unfortunately, that baby had overwhelming infection and died. Uh, so uh, we know that that uh, phenomenon can, can happen. It can happen fairly quickly. Now, the question is, it, if the uh, uh, dose or two of antibiotics that the baby has received before the blood culture is done is sufficient to cure the bacteremia, did it cure the infection? And that's a question that we don't really have an answer to. Uh, and Canty would argue that to a large extent, yeah, uh, the culture is negative, the infection has been cured, you don't need to treat more. Uh, and that leads into the question of how many days of antibiotics are necessary. Maybe three days is enough, uh, period. Uh, there are some studies that look at the difference between four days and seven days. Uh, some look seven to 10, uh, but we don't really know what the required duration of treatment is. Uh, and when you look at that body of literature, it is confounded. Uh, by the fact that many of the babies who are treated with shorter durations of antibiotics didn't have infection at all. So, of course, you can treat with fewer days of antibiotics because they're not infected. Uh, and uh, one of those papers, for example, came from one of my own partners, uh, Alistair Phillip, uh, who looked at babies with pneumonia uh, at one of our uh, community-affiliated hospitals, uh, and he found that, that they could shorten the duration of antibiotic therapy to the time at which the C-reactive protein returned to normal. Uh, 
So the, the mean duration of treatment in, in that series of babies, I think they were about 120, was only about four days, and they did well. But if you look at that population, most of those babies never had an elevated C-reactive protein. So they were never infected. So they didn't need to be treated at all. Four days was four days too many. So uh, that is, it's a perceptive question. Uh, and when you start to drill into this, you can see how quickly it becomes really complicated. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So the next question is, do you advocate practice of sending blood culture on admission to all the babies who have risk factors for early onset sepsis? No. Uh, we, uh, for many years, uh, had a practice uh, in compliance with the national guidelines that if mom had chorioamnionitis, uh, the, the baby should be immediately evaluated and treated. Uh, and uh, we were essentially treating 100% of those babies. Uh, in 2015, uh, we transitioned to treating only the babies who showed clinical signs of illness. Uh, and our exposure rates uh, in, in our chorioamnionitis exposed babies, exposure rates to antibiotics dropped initially from 100% uh, to about 12% and then to 5%. Uh, and uh, we're still con uh, continuing to treat about three to 5% of our chorioamnionitis exposed uh, babies with empiric antibiotics, but we're only doing uh, blood cultures on the babies at the time that they show clinical signs of illness uh, and uh, antibiotics are going to be initiated. What we found is that the vast majority in the uh, now eight years of experience that we have with that approach, the uh, almost all of the babies who have bacterial infection or symptomatic right at birth. Uh, we have had a few babies who became symptomatic over the next 24 hours or so, and they have all been recognized as not behaving normally uh, by our bedside nursing staff, uh, who we've trained uh, to do a very simple limited evaluation based on the work of Alberta Berardi in, in Italy, uh, where we look to see, uh, uh, does the baby uh, uh, appear well perfused? Are there signs of respiratory distress? Uh, is the baby feeding normally? Uh, and if the baby passes those, uh, the uh, nurse assists mom uh, with breastfeeding. And if not, uh, the uh, pediatrician uh, is called. Then we have the luxury of having a pediatrician in house. Uh, we can go and examine that baby straight away. Uh, and uh, all of the babies, uh, I think we've had nine or 10 uh, over that period of time uh, with culture proven bacterial sepsis. Uh, all of them have uh, revealed themselves as being clinically ill. So no, I, I'm not a believer uh, in the whole construct of a screening uh, bacterial culture. Uh, for many years, that's always been a head scratcher for me. If you think that the probability that blood culture is going to be positive is reasonably high, high enough to justify sending it, why aren't you treating that baby? And if you don't, why are you sending a blood culture that you think is going to be negative? It just doesn't make sense to me. So wait until the baby shows signs of clinical illness and then invest in a much smaller number of blood cultures. It'll be much more cost effective. Uh, the yield will be higher uh, and your treatments will, will be better focused. We're still going to end up treating a lot more babies than are actually infected. And right now at Stanford, despite our major efforts to reduce our antibiotic exposure, uh, we are, are still treating about 100 babies for everyone that actually has positive blood culture. Now, what happened? You know, it used to be that we were only treating 40 and we instituted a policy uh, to try to reduce our antibiotic use uh, and the ratio went up. And what happened was that the prevalence of early onset sepsis went down by about tenfold uh, because of obstetrical interventions. Our OBs are doing such a good job of preventing infection in our neonates, thanks to them. Uh, I love our OBs. Uh, but uh, the result of that is that the ratio of treatment to true disease has actually gone up because our proportion of true disease has gone down so dramatically, which is exactly what we want. Thank you. Thank you, Sadhguru, for the elaborate, very elaborate uh, answer. So we have a uh, very interesting uh, question which has come up. Uh, Dr. Daniel Alejandro has asked, do we have an advantage if you inoculate more than one ml of blood in the culture. You told 1ml is the ideal specific. 
Yeah. Uh, so do you have any advantage of more than one? Yeah, you know, the, the argument is, has generally been on the other side. Can you get away with less? Because blood is so hard to get from these babies. Uh, the, there is some advantage uh, to going to a higher yield. But what I showed you is that the prevalence of uh, low density bacteremia is in, in our patient population is really low. Now, it turns out this doesn't apply to uh, older kids and it certainly doesn't apply to adults. You know, we all learned in medical school uh, that if you have an adult with fever of unknown origin, you, you've got to draw uh, blood cultures, five or 10 ml. Uh, and then you got to come back in six hours. You got to do it again. You got to come back in six hours and do it again. Uh, because ultra low density bacteremia in adults, particularly those with endocarditis is extremely common. Uh, so that's not the case uh, in our population. So I don't think that there's a huge advantage uh, to trying uh, to get really large volumes. Of course, we don't want to go to five or 10 ml because that's a huge part of our baby's blood volume. Uh, if you can get a little bit extra, yeah, go for it, but probably not more than two ml. Uh, and if you can get one and do that consistently, I would consider you, you to be practicing at, at a very high level. Thank you. Thank you, uh, 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 Dr. Bennett. For, and, uh, how, how many more questions you will be able to take, uh, Dr. Bennett? Uh, uh, I, I have an appointment in about six hours. Oh, six. So, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, okay. So we'll try to finish. By, by then, I think all of you will want to be in bed. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, so, okay, we will try to finish as much as, as many questions as possible. Uh, Dr. Bharat is asking: Can we assume that for late preterm with risk factors, we need not include blood culture if asymptomatic? Uh, yeah, to a certain extent. Uh, for the late preterm, uh, I'm very comfortable. If we're dealing with babies that are more than 34, 35 weeks, uh, that's been a part of our practice now for eight years. Uh, and, and I'm quite confident that that's safe. Uh, the Not just the 40,000 babies or so that we've uh, managed here uh, at our primary site, but at our satellite hospital, the one where Dr. Philip used to work, uh, uh, has another 25,000 uh, babies or so in their experience. Uh, there's experience uh, from uh, Norway, from actually two different centers there uh, that have adopted this approach. And there's fairly extensive uh, experience. I think the overall experience in uh, Italy is now on the range of 100,000 babies. Uh, so I think that uh, in the late preterm and full-term babies, the approach, uh, as my wife says, just look at the baby. Uh, is a good one. It's it's safe. The uh, the trick there is that somebody actually does have to look at the baby, uh, and uh, there's a resource utilization issue. And if you're in a place where uh, you can't have a trained practitioner uh, with at least the minimal skill set to look at a baby and say, yeah, this baby looks okay, or no, this baby doesn't. Uh, you know, that, that can be uh, a community health worker, it could be a nurse midwife, it can be a bedside obstetrical nurse. Uh, it doesn't have to be a doctor, uh, but somebody has to be looking at the baby and uh, checking to be sure that they're not tachypnic, they're not badly perfused, uh, they're not hypotonic, they're not lethargic, they're feeding okay. Uh, uh, and if uh, they hit those marks, uh, those babies are at, at very low risk. The place where things become difficult is when you go before 30, below 34 weeks. Uh, and uh, uh, Sagri Mukopade and Karen Popolo in, in Philadelphia have two papers uh, that have identified uh, low risk babies. Uh, so the preterm infant that is born uh, without rupture of membranes, without signs of uh, chorioamnionitis, uh, for maternal indications, of course, usually is maternal hypertensive disease. Uh, uh, those babies are at very low risk and uh, you don't need to initiate antibiotics on those babies. Uh, even uh, though uh, being premature, a lot of them are going to have respiratory distress. Uh, so I think that's a start. It turns out about a third of the babies meet those low, low risk criteria. Uh, so that's another opportunity for better antibiotic stewardship. Uh, uh, we've been trying to take advantage of that. I think our crew for the last three or four years has been pretty good uh, in that population, but as an area where we're still acquiring comfort. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kedar wants to know if there is a delay in processing blood culture, how and where to keep the bottle? Uh, 
how warm to keep the bottle uh, where, where where do you store the bottle before if it is, if there is a delay in processing the blood culture like... uh the, usually when there's a delay uh, it's it's not a matter of uh having a, a place to store uh if you know for example that your courier is only going to be coming by every 12 hours uh to pick up the specimen to take it to the laboratory uh, putting it in an incubator at 37 degrees would be great. Uh, so having a warm cabinet, a, a lot of us have blanket warmers. Uh, you can put a box in your blanket warmer and drop it in there uh, and keep it warm. That's better than sitting uh, uh, out on the counter, uh, which you know here in our conditioned buildings, we run at 20 uh, to 22 degrees. Uh, so uh, bacterial growth is slower, as I showed you on that slide, uh, but uh, keeping it warm uh, if you can. Uh, the uh, uh, practice patterns uh, in the states vary quite a bit. Uh, one of our large integrated healthcare systems here in Northern California, the Kaiser system, the home of the Kaiser sepsis calculator, uh, does all of their bacteriology at, at a centralized laboratory in Oakland. So uh, the cultures that are obtained uh, in any of their nurseries uh, go to their laboratory. I'm not sure exactly what they do with them, but I think that they're kept at room temperature. Uh, until the courier comes and takes them over to Oakland. Uh, and that, uh, my understanding is typically happens early in the evening. So between six and eight in the afternoon, they come uh, pick up the cultures and they get uh, into the incubator. Uh, but they're able to do that uh, pretty routinely. So the delay is not more than the 12 to 16 hours uh, that I showed you on that slide uh, earlier. And it doesn't substantially prolong the time to positivity. Uh, but if you're, you're dealing with uh, you know, different circumstances, uh, keeping it warm if you can. Uh, if not, uh, then it may be that you need to uh, increase the incubation uh, or the time from sampling to the time of uh, interpretation to 48 hours. Uh, but that would have to be based on, uh, you know, local data. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Parsarji wants to know what type of culture method was used all in all these studies, like, uh, like back tech or older traditional culture methods? What was the a type of culture. No, uh, all of the uh, data that I showed you in my slides is with the back tech uh, device uh, or something that's uh, uh, similar. One of the slides used the VersaTech, but almost all of these use the back tech technology. Yeah, the older technologies, uh, you know, I, I remember in the days when I was in medical school, uh, we, you remember you held up the bottle and you shook it a little bit and you decided whether it was cloudy or not. Uh, that was not a sensitive assay. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I relied on that. Thank you, sir. RJ? You have to unmute. You have to unmute, RJ. Un unmute. Yeah. So the next question is about the many times for the CSF cell count and proteins are elevated. Uh, but the uh, how to approach those kind of scenarios? Should you treat them as meningitis in both the scenarios where the blood culture is negative and uh, when the blood culture is positive? Yeah, uh, it's good to hear that you guys grapple with the same nightmares that I grew up and continue to grapple with my whole career. Uh, you know, here's the problem. Uh, you, you have a baby who's sick. Uh, and one of my aphorisms is that uh, a sick baby could be septic and a septic baby could have meningitis. Uh, so uh, we don't like to do LPs. There's something uh, emotional. Uh, that drives our reluctance to do that. It's not scientific, it's not rational, uh, but we often will start antibiotics, you know, send a blood culture, then start the antibiotics, so that sequence is correct. Uh, and then only when there are additional laboratory abnormalities or the baby uh, shows behavioral changes that suggest meningitis or simply isn't getting better, uh, do we come back around maybe in a day or two uh, and we do a spinal tap uh, and lo and behold, the baby's got a high protein, a low glucose, a CSF pleocytosis, negative gram stain, and a negative culture. There's a new technology which is coming uh, into practice, the BioFire uh, panel uh, that is being used in this country a great deal. I'm sure it's available there in India. I don't know how much it costs, uh, but uh, because it's DNA detection, uh, and because the concentration of bacteria uh, in the spinal fluid of babies that have meningitis is actually pretty high, 
the limited sensitivity issues with respect to using those technologies on blood are not nearly as applicable. It looks as though the buyer fire uh, sensitivity is sufficient to be able to reliably identify bacterial infection. I think that's our escape hatch uh, to get out of this conundrum. Uh, so uh, when you get the specimen, uh, uh, set aside a little bit for molecular diagnostic techniques if those are available to you, because I, I think that's the only way we can get this resolved. Otherwise, we fall back on, you know, our infectious disease people come and they say, oh, we're sorry, you know, you've got 35 red blood or white blood cells in that spinal fluid, and that's not normal for a five-day-old baby. Uh, and, well, arguably it might be, uh, but they have a point. And then the protein is elevated. Okay, now you have another point, and we end up treating those babies for two or three weeks with antibiotics. Uh, and, you know, by five days, they might be perfectly fine. Uh, so they're a long time in our intermediate nursery plugged into an IV. Uh, uh, it would be great if we could use the molecular technologies to get disentangled from that. I think that's our best bet. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So Dr. Aswin so wants to know, how valid is the WHO guidelines uh, to use ampicillin plus gentamicin as the first line of therapy in low and medium income countries? Oh boy, you know, I don't practice there, so I'm hesitant to comment. Uh, you know, uh, those of you uh, that, that practice in environments uh, where the bacteriology is different uh, have to make your own adaptations. I do watch uh, the uh, literature uh, from around the world, uh, you know, the uh, Indian Journal of Pediatrics uh, uh, and so forth uh, uh, has fairly regularly informative things. Uh, and sometimes I look at these papers about the bacteriology of the infections you guys deal with, and I go, man, I'm sure glad I don't have to work there uh, because they're dealing with some night nightmare bugs. Uh, so, you know, I, I think the same thing is, is true in large swaths of uh, Africa and Latin America. Uh, and I think it's very patchy. Uh, if you look around Mexico, uh, there are some areas uh, where the bacteriology looks a whole lot like California uh, and uh, others where... Uh, the prevalence of extended uh, spectrum uh, beta-lactamase is very, very high, uh, particularly, you know, in the rural areas there where antibiotic use has been quite uncontrolled. Uh, so I, th I think you have to know what's going on uh, in your local environment. Uh, I think the hospital-based antibiograms are extremely helpful. Uh, so your microbiology laboratory can really help you out with that. Uh, but uh, those recommendations... Uh, Maybe they're the best recommendation overall for a broad scale, but they're not targeted to individual places and, and you have to individualize. Thank you, sir. So Dr. Kedar again wants to know, what is the correlation between maternal urinary tract infection and neurotal sepsis? So you, uh, you, your audio broke up a little bit on my end. Uh, can you give me that again? So what is the correlation between maternal urinary tract infection and neonatal sepsis? Oh, boy. Uh, maternal urinary tract infection and neonatal sepsis. Um, I don't know. Uh, if you look at the paper I did in uh, 1998 with uh, Dr. Gould and Dr. Drusen, uh, we thought at that point that maternal UTI was a, a, a marker uh, for risk. I'm not sure that it is. Uh, I, I think that uh, moms who have root B strep uh, present in the urine on the routine prenatal uh, urine culture, what they're, what's done is screening. Uh, that's a marker of heavy colonization with GBS. Uh, and I, th I think that, uh, you know, at that point, you basically don't need to do a screening uh, rectovaginal culture, you know that mom's heavily colonized and she needs interpartum prophylaxis for GPS uh, on that basis alone. Uh, but uh, uh, whether there's a relationship with the other more common causes of maternal urinary tract infections, E. coli in particular, uh, and uh, risk of infection in the babies, I think has really not been adequately studied. And I, I'm not sure that there's an increased risk there. Right. Uh, Dr. Nalini wants to know, I am not sure whether I am getting it right. 
if blood culture negative in preterm with setback that means we can stop antibiotics after 36 hours if backed up is negative yes yeah so yeah Yes. Uh, if, if you send a blood culture and it's negative at 36 hours, uh, you can confidently stop the antibiotics knowing that the baby was not bacteremic at the time you sent the blood culture. Uh, but now, if, if the back tuck comes much more earlier, so if the back tuck is negative? Uh, well, the the back tech result, the, the timing data that I showed you is with the back tech machine. Yeah. Yeah, so, it yeah, really, so even then it should be 36 hours then. Yeah, 36 hours uh, is still the current standard. Now, uh, if uh, you're in a place where almost all of your infections are E. coli and GBS, uh, then you probably could move to 24. Uh, and uh, Joseph Canty uh, in uh, uh, Texas, whose work I've relied on heavily, uh, is uh, currently running a, a, a prospective evaluation of stopping at 24 hours uh, and trying to demonstrate that that is safe. The problem is that we're looking at a low prevalence uh, uh, condition and within that, a low prevalence uh, complication. So it's gonna take a large sample size to be confident in that. Uh, but the, the data I showed you on time to positivity is with the back tech machine uh, and uh, 36 hours should give you a good level of confidence across the full spectrum of organisms. The uh, late uh, positives, uh, the uh, bacteroides and uh, coagulase negative staph that grow after 36 hours are, are almost certainly uh, contaminants and not true positive bacteremias. Um, so the caveat and the reason for the uh, last four or five slides in my talk is that you can stop antibiotics with confidence that the baby was not bacteremic. That means that you still have to look and make sure that the baby doesn't have a focal bacterial infection somewhere that's not associated with bacteremia. Uh, so at, as we were getting used to this, I was uh, on rounds one morning with, with one of my very junior colleagues, somebody who I had trained as a resident <coughs> and a fellow, uh, and they had a baby that was four days old and was still on antibiotics and had a negative culture, uh, but the baby was still on uh, fairly generous CPAP, good oxygen supplementation, had infiltrates on his chest X-ray. And John said, Bill, I'm really sorry. I just can't stop the antibiotics on this baby. And I said, John, you don't have to apologize. What you're telling me is that this baby's got bacterial pneumonia and you're treating it. And that makes sense. And a lot of those kids don't have positive blood cultures. I'm with you. Uh, so uh, before you stop antibiotics, just based on the positive uh, or the negative culture, make sure that you don't have a focal bacterial infection somewhere because you don't want to fall into that crap. Uh, so yeah, judgment's yeah, difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Elisabetta wants to know, how long do you observe the babies with risk factors for early onset sepsis in whom you don't start antibiotics? That is, before being reassured that they are okay and we can discharge them. How, 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 how long you are to wait? Minimum of 24 hours. Absolute minimum. Uh, uh, most moms uh, here in the U.S. will stay uh, beyond 24 hours, usually typically closer to 48. Uh, when we introduced this practice back in 2015 and we were training our nurses to do this, uh, they were very reluctant to take this on. They said, you know, we're, we're busy nurses. The last thing we want is another task. We don't need more work. Uh, and we pointed out to them that somewhere between 40 and 60% of uh, the babies who are uh, in this low risk, uh, late preterm and term group who are gonna get uh, bacterial infection, were going to fall ill on their watch out on the floor with their mom. They're not sick at birth, they get sick later uh, and they don't have risk factors. Uh, and uh, you, you can look at this information in uh, uh, like the uh, reports of the implementation of the Kaiser sepsis calculator. Uh, and they said, oh, my God, 40 percent of the babies are going to uh, who are going to get sick are going to do it on on our watch. What can we do? Uh, and that helped a lot. And then what we were able to negotiate, we had been having them do frequent vital signs on babies with risk factors for the entire hospital stay. And we said, how about if we take that workload and we uh, reallocate it so that you're doing close observation on all babies for the first 24 hours? And you'll do it every four hours. And they said, yeah, you know, that's that's a, uh, uh, an equal swap. We'll do that. 
Uh, and then after implementation, uh, uh, there was a drift in practice. They said, you know, it's, it's too much trouble to uh, do this on a schedule every four hours. How about if we just do it whenever we go to help mom breastfeed, which is every two to three hours in a brand new baby. And we said, yeah, more often is fine. We don't mind that. Uh, and they learned that the evaluation only takes like 20 seconds. It's very quick. Uh, and our documentation people put in a little uh, window uh, on our computer system. So that's click, 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 and they're done. Uh, so even documenting it didn't take very much time. Uh, and then they said, you know, wondering whether the baby is more than 24 hours, or less than 24 hours old, is just too much work. We'll just do it the whole time. So they do it until the baby goes home. Uh, but uh, the rule that we've had is for a minimum of 24 hours. Only one of the babies who's developed bacterial uh, sepsis, who was not uh, obviously ill at the time of birth, uh, became ill after 24 hours of age. Uh, and that baby got sick at about 36 hours. Right, Dr. Jamie wants to know whether you can comment on the effect of unnecessary antibiotic use for possible early onset sepsis and the increased frequency of true late onset sepsis in a very low birth weight baby. Yeah, uh, Carrie Byington uh, in uh, Utah published a paper uh, which, which I think bears paying attention to uh, where uh, a very carefully performed uh, analysis where they showed that uh, babies who received uh, interpartum prophylaxis in a risk-adjusted way uh, were more likely to develop late onset sepsis uh, than the babies who did not uh, receive uh, early uh, treatment. Um, and I, I think that's a potential adverse uh, outcome of poor antibiotic stewardship. Uh, I think it might be real. Uh, there's a study going on in preterm infants right now called the NANO trial, N-A-N-O, uh, that's uh, run out of the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Poland is one of the uh, principals uh, on that trial where they're looking at randomizing uh, preterm infants uh, who are neither low risk nor high risk, but in the intermediate range uh, to receive ampicillin and genomycin uh, empirically or placebo, both groups are getting a blood culture done. Uh, and uh, they're only partway through enrollment for that trial. I hope they're able to finish that. Uh, but the prevalence of necrotizing enterocolitis and the prevalence of uh, late onset sepsis is going to be one of the important endpoints there. Uh, so I, I think it is the low birth weight babies that are the, the uh, risk population there, uh, probably not so much in the term babies. Uh, but I think reducing uh, early exposure to antibiotics may have a benefit with respect to late onset disease. Arjay. Yeah, Dr. Jami again wants to know that uh, under the antibiotic stewardship philosophy, how long do we think we should treat these babies? Five days? Or uh, do we know any other experience with this uh, length of treatment? For babies with a positive culture? Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, people have nipped around that a bit. Uh, the, uh, there are some studies that look at four or five days uh, versus seven or 10. Uh, I don't think that the numbers there are sufficient uh, or that the diagnostic criteria for inclusion are sufficiently specific to be able to draw any real conclusions about that. You know, uh, the uh, rule of thumb uh, that we've used, uh, one of my colleagues says that uh, the duration of antibiotics treatment uh, in uh, neonates, uh, in fact, in pediatrics in general in the United States is based on football scores, not soccer scores where you only get one point for a goal. Uh, but here you get three points for a field goal, seven points for a touchdown. Uh, so uh, we treat for three, seven, ten <coughs> Uh, so if it's not a, a football score viable number, we don't use it for duration of treatment. Go figure. Uh, but I don't think there's a lot of, uh, of actual empiric science that guides uh, how long is enough. So there's definitely an opportunity uh, uh, to uh, try to define that. There was a paper many years ago, probably 30 years ago, uh, from uh, Toronto, where they treated babies with uh, gram-negative meningitis for only seven days. Uh, the sample size was not huge, uh, 
uh, but they found that they had no recurrence of disease, gram-negative meningitis, predominantly E. coli, uh, uh, after only seven days of treatment. And of course, routinely, we would treat that for 21. So 21 is probably too many. Uh, when I was uh, a resident, uh, we used criteria called Whirly's criteria for deciding the duration of treatment of bacterial meningitis in kids, uh, which meant we kept the treatment going until the CSF was perfectly normal. Uh, and uh, often that would result in treatment for really long periods of time, three, four or five weeks. Uh, and then somebody had the idea, maybe that wasn't really necessary. And uh, we evolved towards the new standard of uh, 10 days uh, for gram negative and uh, or 14 days for gram, gram positive meningitis and 21 days for gram negative meningitis, uh, which was shorter than what we had been using previously. And there was no downside. So I think there's more opportunity there, but the short answer is uh, we don't really know how much is enough. Um, I'm not a big believer in the four or five day courses. Uh, and I, I think that my bias there comes from the fact that uh, what I observe is that if somebody is treating for five days, it's because they don't know whether the baby's infected or not. Uh, and if not, they would stop at 36 hours or not later than three days. Uh, and if so, they would treat for seven to 10 days. So they split the difference and then they treat for five. Uh, and I think if that's just an indication of confusion, that's not useful. Uh, so some data would be helpful. Now, so, now, now, so is there any correlation between PCR and blood culture for bacterial infections? And what is the role of PCR in sepsis, neurosepsis? Oh boy, the role of PCR in sepsis. Uh, I think it's undemonstrated so far. I think the, the biofire uh, PCR for meningitis because of the high density uh, of bacteria uh, in infected spinal fluid is terrific. Uh, I, I'm really pleased to see that uh, come into our diagnostic toolbox. It's gonna help us a lot. Uh, the problem with uh, PCR for bacteremia uh, uh, even in neonates, you know, we're, we're lucky. We're dealing with the uh, babies who have relatively high density bacteremia as opposed to adults who have much lower densities. Uh, but the chances that you're going to find a single viable organism in a sample uh, is small. And if you're using the kinds of uh, uh, volumes that are used for these molecular techniques, you may be using 50 or 30 or 20 microliters of plasma. Uh, that's not enough. Just, you know, Poisson says, forget about it. The chances that you're going to, uh, in that tiny, tiny sample, get the organism that you're interested in is minuscule. Uh, so you, you've got to find some way uh, to uh, capture the single organism in a much larger volume, one, five, 10 ml. Uh, and I think that that's going to be an insurmountable problem for the time being. Uh, it's one of the reasons that uh, Melio, the uh, people that I've, I've been doing some advisory work for are interested in the neonatal population uh, because uh, they understand Poisson math really well. Uh, and they realize that the higher density bacteremia in the neonate uh, is a target for them, uh, that they can actually uh, get the uh, organism uh, circulating in, in a one ml uh, sample. Uh, and they have technology that I'm optimistic is going to turn out to be helpful for us. It's not going to help the uh, older population until they figure out some way to do bioconcentration. So the other place where uh, PCR is, is uh, really promising is in uh, speeding up uh, the uh, recognition of uh, presence of bacteria in blood cultures. Uh, so uh, a lot of these technologies, you can incubate your blood culture for six or 12 hours and then use a P PCR technology uh, to uh, uh, identify the presence of the organism in your blood culture, but not directly in blood. Thank you, sir. So another interesting question from Dr. Mamta Panda. So he wants to know that if the blood culture is negative, that means a culture negative baby, but the clinical situation is like they're not doing good clinically, and hypothermic persistently. And so do you start antibiotic in this kind of uh, scenarios provided other conditions of, uh, have been excluded? I'm sorry, we've got a jackhammer going outside here. Uh, let me see if I move to a quieter place. <laughs> 
So if the it's a situation where the culture is negative, but the baby is not doing clinically good, so whether to start antibiotics or not. Oh, uh, that's clinical judgment, you know. Uh, you know, again, I think you need to have a reasonable hypothesis that there's some focal bacterial infection somewhere. In our population, that's going to be uh, primarily pneumonia. Uh, so if you think the baby's got respiratory distress, has chest uh, x-ray infiltrates, uh, signs of an acute uh, inflammatory response, CBC, CRP, whatever, uh, and your culture is negative and you want to continue antibiotics, I'm amenable to that. Um, but, you know, I, I think one of the problems with, uh, and I alluded to this in one of the early slides, uh, is if we say, well, the blood culture is negative, but the baby's really septic, uh, that stops us from thinking. And we stop asking the question, what's really wrong with this baby? You know, uh, I, I had a conversation with one of my uh, junior colleagues yesterday evening uh, uh, about a baby who's four weeks old is continuing to have problems with respiratory distress. Uh and uh, has had recurrent episodes of lactic acidemia. Uh, and you know, one of the questions I had for him is, uh, is mom from South Asia, is she on a primarily rice diet? He said, oh, she is from South Asia. I'll ask her about her diet. Maybe she's thiamine deficient. Maybe the baby's thiamine deficient. Uh, they, uh, the, the baby responded uh, at the beginning uh, to support with TPN, got better. Uh, but then they transitioned the baby to mom's breast milk probably also thiamine deficient, uh, if that's the case, uh, and the baby got sick again. <clears throat> so, you know, if we're uh, saying, oh, this baby has culture negative sepsis, and we're just not getting it with the antibiotics that we're using, and we forget to ask the additional questions, we're never going to figure those things out. Uh, yeah, there are quite a few questions regarding the inflammatory markers like CRP, procalcitonin. Uh, a, a elevated CRP, elevated procalcitonin, but you have a culture negative. Uh, so what do you do in such babies? Uh, I try to get people not to send those tests. Uh, you know, their predictive value is not very good. Uh, if you look at the paper that I published in 1998, uh, which at the time was the largest series of babies who'd had CRPs performed, uh, I think we had about 1,200 kids. Subsequently, there's been one that had about 1,400, came pretty much the same conclusions. Uh, uh, one of the things that we looked at was the positive predictive value of uh, elevated uh, C-reactive protein as a function of how high it was. So not surprisingly, the higher the CRP, the more likely the baby uh, was given a diagnosis of sepsis. Uh, but if you look at that figure, uh, we uh, have bars for clinically uh, suspected sepsis and for culture-proven sepsis. For culture-proven sepsis, the uh, prevalence of uh, infection was less than 10% uh, with elevations uh, above about two to three uh, milligrams per deciliter uh, and didn't increase much beyond that. For suspected disease, uh, the prevalence was much higher and it continued to increase as the CRP levels went up. Uh, and the problem with that is that the logic is uh, circular uh, because uh, we relied on the clinician's diagnosis for clinical sepsis. They relied on the CRP to tell us whether there was clinical sepsis. So if it was high, they made the diagnosis. We scored it and we said that a high CRP was a good predictor of clinical sepsis. It's a good predictor of the doctor thinking there's clinical sepsis, but I have no idea what that means. Uh, so I, uh, you know, I, I was introduced uh, once at one of these conferences as uh, Dr. CRP uh, on the basis of that paper. Uh, and the farther along that I get, the less I think CRP uh, has a role. Uh, and I think the same is true for procalcitonin and so far for all of the other inflammatory markers, you know, IL-6, IL-10, whatever. Uh, and the, the problem is that they uh, take too long to be Become detectably abnormal, uh, and they're very, very nonspecific. Uh, so uh, as I've looked at the data, I don't think that CRP adds anything to the diagnostic value of the blood culture. So I would invest the blood, put it in the blood culture bottle, 
and don't send those diagnostic tests. So uh, I, I think I'm uh, a bit of a prophet crying in the wilderness uh, in that regard, because most people are going to continue to to use these diagnostic tests, but I, I really think they have very little utility. Okay, thank you. Dr. Vanita just wants to know how uh, to clinically diagnose uh, or suspect occult focal infection and confidently stop antibiotics if the blood yeah. culture is negative. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I think you rely on a careful examination. Uh, I think a chest X-ray uh, can be really helpful. Uh, certainly, if the baby's got signs of respiratory distress, you probably already got a chest X-ray anyway. Uh, so uh, the other conditions are a lot more difficult. Uh, you know, osteomyelitis, you're probably going to have to pick up because of abnormal movement uh, of the baby. You'll notice, uh, you know, the baby's not moving a leg because there's osteomyelitis from the area of the hip, uh, things of that sort. So a careful physical exam. Uh, Maybe a chest X-ray is a screening test. Um, thinking about uh, meningitis, uh, particularly in the babies who are behaviorally abnormal, not eating well, um, doing the LP, uh, and then struggling with uh, interpreting the results when you get them back. Um, but you know that's it's a really really difficult task, uh, and that's a place where I think the basic science people who are looking at uh, a more uh, sophisticated systems-based approach to the use of proteomics uh, or metabolomics uh, may be able to help us know uh, which babies are, are sick because they have some other inflammatory process uh, and which ones are actually activating the innate immune system. Not an easy, easy task. Uh, do you have any advice for low and middle income countries uh, in the management of sepsis, as far as management of sepsis is concerned, or diagnosis as well as management? You mean? Uh, any advice for those? For the low work? and middle income countries. People yeah. In low and uh, income. Yeah. Take everything that those of us that live in high income countries with a grain of salt. Uh, you know, uh, we don't live in your environment and. You need to uh, take the kinds of discussions, you know, uh, you'll notice that I, I didn't give a lot of specific recommendations about what you should do. Uh, and I didn't titrate this talk in that way for your benefit. This was the same talk that I gave at the PAS a year and a half ago. Uh, and I've given it a couple of times for conferences here in the US. Uh, I'm not very prescriptive because, uh, you know, we have more questions than answers. Uh, but you can see how I try to grapple with these issues, what the thought processes are. Uh, so I, I think you can use the, the template of the process, but you have to apply the information that you have from your own environments and your own practices. Uh, and, you know, I'm really pleased when I, when I see things uh, uh, coming uh, from low and middle income countries where people are actually doing the epidemiology uh, and uh, uh, doing the uh, kinds of interventions that get to uh, what's really relevant uh, to the populations that are dealing with. Uh, it's a different set of problems and you, you have to uh, really individualize it to your own settings. I'm very sympathetic. It's hard, hard work. Thank you, Arjun. Arjun. Yeah. So the next question is from Dr. Wasim, whether we should treat the sick newborn with antibiotics with a rising CRP and negative blood culture? Uh, so what do you do about antibiotics when the CRP is going up and the blood culture is negative? Uh, yeah. You look for a source of inflammation somewhere. Um, you know, uh, the, the causes of an elevated CRP on the paper that we published in 1998 uh, we had a table where there were 36 other diagnoses uh, that were associated with an elevated CRP in our 1,000 babies. Uh, and the editors make us, made us take the table out. I think it was a terrible mistake. Uh, but uh, the things that we found that are associated with uh, an elevated CRP are, are things like a stroke. Um, you know, we, we've had babies that uh, fall ill on, on day one or are ill from the beginning. Uh, we work them up for sepsis, treat them. It turns out not to be CRP still going up. Baby's still not behaviorally appropriate. Uh, 
uh, eventually somebody decides uh, to get an MRI, uh, and sure enough, the baby's got a middle cerebral artery infarct. Uh, so if, if there's an area of tissue necrosis anywhere, the CRP is going to, uh, to increase. Uh, and uh, those kinds of ischemic injuries, you know, unfortunately, thromboembolic disease in babies is typically in the head, uh, but it can be kidney, it can be gut. Uh, so uh, you have to look uh, for those uh, other focal sources of uh, inflammatory change. Uh, the other categories of disease are in that last group that I showed the uh, uh, inflammatory processes, things uh, like uh, maternal uh, lupus erythematosus. Uh, if moms uh, got autoantibodies and they're affecting the baby, uh, baby's CRP will rise. Uh, but uh, that's very nonspecific. Oh, and another diagnosis that uh, we found was really surprising uh, was RH isoimmunization. Uh, there, there's something about the red blood cell breakdown with isoimmunization that activates the immune system and the CRP goes up. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I wish I had been able to publish that uh, table of 36 other things, but just think of anything that you can imagine that causes, that activates neutrophils uh, will we'll bump the CRP. It's a long list. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Dr. Vanita wants to know, what are the current diagnostics available in clinical practice to diagnose occult focal infections in order to stop antibiotics confidently? Good question. Uh, you know, I, I think that the key word is probably the last one there. Um, I think as a general phenomenon, we shouldn't be too confident in anything that we do. Uh, so uh, if the uh, baby is doing well and the blood culture is negative, that's the easy case, right? Then you can probably be pretty confident that stop the antibiotics, baby's going to be okay. Uh, if the baby is still sick and the antibiotics are, are and the culture is negative, uh, then stopping the antibiotics is something you might do with a little bit more trepidation. Uh, but in either case, I, I think you have to continue to follow the baby uh, for a little while. The problem is that when babies are, when children develop recurrent bacterial infection uh, after uh, partial effective treatment, it doesn't happen in a few hours. Uh, I looked at this literature, there's none in neonates, but there's some in older kids. Uh, and typically it's 10 days to two weeks after the cessation of antibiotics. And we can't keep the kids in the hospital to observe them that long. The reason I looked it up was we used to have a habit. We'd stop the antibiotics and we watched the babies for three days or the children for three days uh, to be sure they didn't get sick again before they went home. Uh, so we were watching them during the time when they weren't going to get sick again. And then we sent them home and stopped watching them when they actually were sick, at risk for that. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know uh, really what the precise answer for that is, except uh, think carefully uh, and uh, don't be too confident. Uh, you know, I tell my uh, residents and fellows, uh, what you do is not nearly as important as how carefully you pay attention to the consequences. Uh, so, you know, make a decision, go with it, and then realize that maybe it was the wrong one and pay attention and detect that uh, before the patient gets into trouble. Thank you, sir. So, Dr. Vijay Singh Day wants to know, that uh, in babies with meconium aspiration syndrome, even with history of meconium stent, amniotic fluid, and respiratory distress, uh, usually they have raised CRPs and they get treated for four to five days with antibiotics. So should you be ignoring their CRPs and uh, seizing the antibiotics at 36 to 48 hours? Yes, I think so. As if the culture uh, is negative uh, in this kind of scenario. Yeah, meconium uh, aspiration is a, a massively inflammatory syndrome. Uh, the lungs do not like having meconium down there, and they uh, mount a, a very nice inflammatory response. Uh, so that was one of the things that was on our list of uh, non-bacteriologic causes of elevated CRP. Uh, so I would expect that if your cultures are negative, uh, you, you can stop. Now, uh, one of the corollaries of that is that I'm a big advocate of uh, obtaining tracheal aspirate cultures uh, for uh, babies who have respiratory distress and pulmonary infiltrates uh, at the time of the initial intubation. Now, uh, when you have a chronically instrumented airway, if you have a baby with bronchopulmonary dysplasia, 
who's been uh, intubated for six weeks and you culture that airway, you're going to find all kinds of horrible, horrible organisms down there, all kinds of bad stuff. Uh, so that's a complete waste of time. Uh, and trying to treat those organisms so far at least looks like it's probably a waste of time. Uh, the uh, trachea should be sterile, though, initially before you uh, intubate it. So uh, in that situation, I encourage people to send a tracheal aspirate for gram stain and culture. Uh, if the gram stain is negative, you can probably cancel the culture. Uh, but uh, uh, if the gram stain is positive, then getting the identification can be really useful. Uh, and I, I think that's really helpful in these kids with meconium aspiration because they're, as you know, they're really sick. Uh, they look septic. They've got a systemic inflammatory response that's just raging. Uh, they're needing a lot of support. But if their culture is negative and their tracheal aspirate is reassuring, uh, you can safely stop the antibiotics. Thank you, sir. Dr. Barma, please. Uh, Dr. Mohammed wants to know if the mother has uh, chore amnionitis and the baby have respiratory distress soon after delivery, is it an indication to start antibiotics and send blood cultures? Yeah, that baby's sick. You know, yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, the, the the answer would be the same. Mom had no signs of any problems at all. Uh, perfectly ordinary, healthy woman. Uh, normal pregnancy, labor, delivery. Baby comes out, baby acts sick. Yep, that baby needs antibiotics. Uh, you know, and, until you get it sorted. Now, the gray zone there is the baby acts just a little bit sick is a little tachypnic and requires uh, half a liter a minute of oxygen by nasal cannula. Uh, and at an hour of age, we're down to two tenths of a liter uh, and the saturations have gone from 92 to 95% and the baby's improving. That's a baby that you might watch and kind of wait and see how it evolves uh, before you start. But uh, if, if the baby has respiratory distress that's uh, needing help, you know, uh, the baby that starts out needing a little blow by oxygen in the delivery room and at two hours of age is on CPAP, that baby's ill. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I, we are extremely thankful for your patience with our questions, though uh, there are a lot of questions more, but I don't think we have already exceeded two hours uh, <laughs> after starting. I think after two more questions, we will stop this discussion. Uh, All right. Okay. Yeah, I think that's what we'll do. Uh, one question is, if the blood culture is positive on day five or seven due to a fastidious organism, uh, should, you should, take it, you, should you take it as a contaminant or a, a real infection? That is the question. Yeah, that's probably a contaminant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the organisms that turn, the cultures that turn positive after 48 hours are very, very rarely uh, true positive cultures. So there, there's another circumstance that we haven't talked about, uh, which is where the culture is uh, positive, but the baby's entirely well. Uh, and this turns out to be an extraordinarily common uh, circumstance. So in the uh, Kaiser sepsis calculator, Mike Kunowitz's paper, uh, they had 51 babies with positive blood cultures, 10 of whom were not treated, not treated, but they were sending screening uh, blood cultures that came back positive. They uh, then looked at all those babies. Most of them had repeat blood cultures. All the repeat, uh, repeat blood cultures were negative. They treated all of them, but none of them got sick in the interval. Well, they didn't treat all of them. In fact, some of them they didn't treat at all ever, uh, and they didn't get sick. Uh, so uh, this issue of transient asymptomatic bacteremia uh, with real pathogens, E. coli and GBS, uh, is, is also a real phenomenon and it confounds our thinking about these things. It makes it really difficult uh, to sort out what's best. Okay. But yeah, late, late positive cultures, I, I wouldn't be excited about. So uh, then uh, with this question, I think we should wind up. Uh, should we do lumbar puncture in all culture positive babies and all late onset, uh, neonates, late onset neonatal sepsis babies? Yes. Yeah. The short answer. Uh, for most of my career, uh, my uh, aphorism for the people I supervised was if you start antibiotics, you do the LP. Simple. Uh, we started a lot of antibiotics. We did a lot of LPs. Our trainees got really good at doing LPs. Uh, 
our yield on our LPs was extraordinarily low, almost zero. Uh, but I, I think if you have a positive culture, if you know that the baby's bacteremic, it's reasonable to look for uh, uh, CSF involvement. Uh, Barbara Stoll had a, a paper in the preterm babies, which is going to be the primary target of your late onset sepsis group, uh, that uh, the prevalence of uh, meningitis in the babies with coagulase negative staph bacteremia was very high. Uh, and uh, similarly, in the uh, term baby that goes home and comes back with late onset group B strep, uh, historically, the prevalence of meningitis in that population was more than 60%. In some of the series, it was 90%. Uh, so if you've got a baby coming back with late onset sepsis, uh, they need to be screened with an LP. Thank you. Uh, Arjit, I think uh, we will stop. Yeah, I think we'll stop. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you for the stimulating conversion. Yeah. Uh, I am uh, really gratified to know that uh, people on the other side of the world literally uh, are struggling with the same difficult problems that we have here. Uh, so let's continue the struggle together. <laughs> Thank you, sir. It was uh, such a wonderful uh, session. The in audience interest can be reflected in the number of questions that keep coming up. And uh, as we say, all the sweet things need to ha have an end somewhere. So we will temporarily stop here. But then we would love to have you again on a, uh, another day if, uh, uh, on a virtual as well as in an in-person session in the future because uh, we really uh, enjoyed uh, your elaborate uh, um, uh, answers to the questions that we always used to have. Some of these questions have been beautifully answered in your uh, lecture. And I'm sure that anyone who deals with newborns in the intensive care uh, or elsewhere will definitely find some of these uh, areas where uh, we have still not uh, really I mean, uh, I mean, uh, answered. And then uh, it's such a thought provoking. I have, uh, probably I would say we have been running this session since um, June 2020, three and a half years. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, probably this is one of the best lectures we have had so far. Thanks to you, sir, uh, Professor Benitz. Uh, it's such a huge honor for us to have you today. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. For, thank you for your kind words. Thank you, sir. And uh, we will talk. Another topic on another day. Yeah, sure, sure, sir. We would love to have you again, sir. I would again contact you with uh, okay. uh, and uh, suggestions for another talk, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank now, you, before sir. we close, uh, I would also like to thank both the moderators, uh, do, uh, Dr. Arjit Mahabatra and Dr. Ravindra Varma, two close friends of mine who had done an excellent job uh, navigating through the questions itself was a challenge. Thank you so much, both of you. And finally, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you finally, uh, before we close today's session, uh, I would like to express our sincere gratitude and uh, I mean, I mean, like uh, real, um, I mean, it, it was such a real honor to have all of you respected attendees for this session. We have been the numbers, uh, attendees have been growing as the sessions go. And thanks to um, uh, legends like Professor Bennett. And uh, now thank you so much for joining us today. Today's session unusually went on from one hour to all, more than two hours. And still we uh, you can see that most of you are still uh, wanting to session to go on. So we'll have it on another day. Uh, I would, uh, before we close, uh, I, thank you all. And then I would invite all of you for the next uh, month session, which is going to be a continuation of the uh, neonatal restoration. So it's a part two of what is new in neonatal restoration lessons. This time it's about, about the lessons from chest compression and survive trial by the uh, in investigator, the original researcher on that, Professor George M. Chauncer. Uh, um, so, again, uh, cordially inviting for the next session. Until we meet again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Dr. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Corporal, corporal, no, no, no.